We're now joined by Professor John Stremelau, who's the Honorary Professor of International Relations at the University of the Witwatersrand here in Johannesburg. Uh, Prof, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Good to have you. Thank you, Peter. Good to be with you. Or I suppose um, what we heard reported today was expected in a way because now we're starting to see high value targets and this is the last opportunity for insurgents to cause chaos. I think that's true in the immediate sense, yes. Um, what was unforeseen was how quickly the military would fold, the Afghan military would fold, that the U.S. Had put so many billions and billions of dollars in over 20 years, and the government itself would flee. But I think that probably the Afghans took stock and they thought, what's the point of fighting for another two years? We've been fighting for 50 years. Let's let the Taliban back in and see if we can get along. But uh, uh, it is concerning to uh, the situ situation facing women. And uh, a theocracy is not something that I think liberal dem Democrats, including South Africa, feel pretty enthusiastic about. But we'll have to wait and see how it shakes out. Meanwhile, there ought to be some review of what, in fact, the U.S. mission was all about for these 20 years. We'll chat about that a little bit more, but in more recent times, the last few days in particular, we saw this uh, suicide bomb attack. Uh, they talk about ISIS-K, and then there's people now speculating that ISIS-K could not have done that much damage without some kind of either permission or participation by the Taliban. I'm not so sure about that, Peter. You know, to do a, a, a suicide bomber is not that complicated. The U.S. knew that these risks were there. They were keeping their fingers crossed that they could get out. It does belie what Trump, what uh, Biden has promised, which was, my goodness, the mission was accomplished back in the, the aftermath of 9-11 with the cleaning out of al-Qaeda, and that the terrorists was no longer a threat. Um, and, and clearly, this has been an embarrassment, not only for the United States, but also for the Taliban. President Biden is taking quite a hiding in terms of how he's handled this. And what's interesting is that he's partly blaming Donald Trump for the deal that was struck, but at the same time, wants to also get credit for pulling his troops out. So how do you explain what's happened and how much blame can he take? Well, it depends on who you talk to. The foreign policy establishment, which got us into this nation building project in the first instance. And of course, I'm, you know, a, a professor of international relations. So I guess I operate with some of the same assumptions. But the Afghanistan adventure, the fact that you use the military uh, as a hammer and everything looks like a nail. So you build military capacity when, in fact, it was a nation building project, which the U.S was grotesquely unsuited to do because it doesn't understand the complexities and never has of Afghanistan. People don't speak the languages, don't understand the cultures and the conflicts and the, and the long history of that. You know, they've always said that, that Afghanistan was a graveyard for empire builders. Well, the U.S. went in with an arrogance after 9-11, and this was the Bush administration. They went into an ar with arrogance into Iraq thinking they could rebuild that society, and they thought they could retransform the Middle East. That, that was hubris beyond belief in retrospect, Peter, in retrospect, so that the criticism has been from the foreign policy establishment, but we're not sure that the criticism will be so strong among the American voters who basically don't care too much about foreign policy anyway. And Biden does have on his hands a huge domestic challenge that he must turn his attention to. So having this Afghanistan distraction um, was just simply not in his interest. And so he committed to get out. And, and it probably wasn't in the Afghanistan's long-term interest. But I suppose what happens next is going to be important, especially when it comes to um, taking care of refugees and also uh, helping the humanitarian effort and human rights effort inside Afghanistan, even after they've gone? 
Well, you've, you've, you've raised a number of very important issues. The humanitarian crisis is very immediate, very real, and UNHCR and others are, are, are pointing to the fact that um, you, you could have millions of people who are undernourished and in danger of, of, of hunger. And somehow it would be, be helpful if the international community could pull together and convince the Taliban to let the humanitarian relief in. Human rights is another issue which is very sensitive and very difficult to do um, from afar. And, and yet, in, in the last few hours, the human rights problems facing women that with, were very personal and very poignant in, in American reporting. Families that were, were disrupted by the bombing, both from the terrorists, but also from the car bombing that the drone of the U.S., uh, hit it, it, it apparently wrecked the family. So the human tragedies on a personal level are very painful and very heartrending. But we have to stand back and think: What was it that the Americans were thinking that they were doing? Can they learn from these lessons? Is there going to be accountability for the bad decisions that were taken? You know, in the in the ballot box. Uh, uh, it, you know, it is a democracy. But with the two parties and the partis the the, the uh, bipartisan agreement to support the Defense Department and to support the anti-Chinese approach that's currently now prevalent in the U.S. foreign policy establishment gives me concern. And I think it should concern South Africans. So 20 years ago, it was about a war on terror and it was about Osama bin Laden and uh, the Twin Towers, etc. cetera. Uh, 20 years later, you pull out of Afghanistan, does the concerns of terror still exist or did they dissipate a long long time ago <laughs> well peter that's a very complicated question um bear in mind that it was jimmy carter and someone i admire greatly and have worked for who approved the decision to give stinger missiles to uh the al-qaeda forces in an anti-soviet effort to make that soviet occupation of afghanistan untenable and then it was the, uh, the al-Qaeda that wanted to create a situation where they felt that the U.S. was anti-Muslim, it's Christian, it doesn't understand the, the, the culture. You know, Donald Trump recently has been so outspoken in his anti-Muslim feeling um, and, and prejudice that you bound to get in reactions. And so the, the, the terrorists that reflect that reaction are with us, and they're going to be with us, and probably America create helped to create some of these forces, and they do have to get uh, in sync with the international community. You know, here's where um, where South Africa can play a restraining voice. South Africa is an example of how you get along. We respect Muslims, we respect Christians, we respect Jews, we respect blacks, we respect whites. Not always as much as we should. But that is our constitutional commitment. That's very, very different than, than the American Constitution. It's very different than uh, how America's behaved. You talk about lessons learned, but you know, Vietnam was just the other day. And I'm sure that after Vietnam, people thought we'd never do this again. But it did happen again. 20 years later, what is the likelihood that an American public would have the appetite for a trillion dollar war of two decades? Very unlikely, but it should not be an isolationist reaction. It should be a let's get engaged in ways that are more, more, more constructive. PEPFAR, for example, down here for HIV AIDS, builds a lot of goodwill for American public health officials, and it became invaluable for that expertise during the COVID crisis. It's a good example of the lower key kind of humanitarian public um, support efforts that aren't, not, are not necessarily military, are not necessarily getting into confrontational mode. Um, I think that, for example, South Africa and African countries looking for agency in moderating the U.S.-China rivalry in Africa is a very constructive thing to approach. Uh, and, 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 and one does not breed terrorists without creating situations where people feel their dignity is questioned and their participation is not taken seriously. We'll have our differences. We have religious differences. We have racial differences. 
But there's no reason why you can't find some common ground. That was the lesson that Nelson Mandela taught the world so eloquently, Peter. I hate to come back to something so provincial, but it is true that South Africa is really exceptional in that regard. And that's why we hope that uh, the, the, the problems of this country get sorted out in the coming weeks and months and years. In the coming weeks, months and years, how does the world treat Afghanistan? Does it treat it, the Taliban, as a legitimate government and uh, exchange ambassadors and treat it like a normal country? Or is there a period of time where we press the pause button? What's going to happen? I think that Durko and South Africa are right to press the pause button. We don't like theocracies. On the other hand, the Chinese and the Russians, who are rather gleeful about the embarrassment of the U.S. and its failed uh, intervention in Afghanistan, are really ready to go ahead and um, uh, set up shop and, and, and be forthcoming. That, that should not concern us too much, except that for the refugee question that you said, it's, it's, it's significant that the Russians and the Chinese, the two countries out of out of the majority of the international community, 97 countries have already said they would be happy to take more Afghan refugees if they felt they had to leave for their own safety. And the Taliban needs to be engaged in these kind of questions. And the Taliban, I think, this time around, unlike the 1990s, wants to be engaged internationally. It has to be engaged internationally because it's, it's got so many problems on its, on its uh, plate right now. It needs international support. But I think some of the members of the international community, including South Africa, including the Europeans, including the Americans, of course, will be hesitant to engage but should not rule out engagement. It would be very bad if the U.S. applied sanctions right now, for example, because the Taliban has got to feel its own way into it's returned. It's been 20 years. There's a new generation of Taliban uh, leaders. There's a new generation of, Af of Afghan leaders uh, or, or Afghan civil, uh, civil society. It never was before. You've got to feel your way through this, Peter. And so let's not rush to judgment. That would be my advice to everybody. All right. Professor John Stremler, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much indeed for joining us on the program.